Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Greening coming to you from the kitchen. I've got Riley here and he's ready to hear another story. I see Elephant and Piggy have snuck into the room and they want to listen too. So let's see what we're going to read today. Riley wants to sit on the kitchen chair so he can see the pictures. How's that, Riles? We're going to read this book called John Deere, That's Who. It's by Tracy Nelson Maurer and illustrated by Tim Zeltner. Now, boys and girls, this book is a nonfiction book. I know a lot of you like to learn things, and this is a true biography about John Deere. So instead of having an E for everybody, although everybody could enjoy this book, there's a 92 on the spine. That's the Dewey Decimal number for biography books. That's where we're going to find this one organized in the library in the M section of the 92s. There's the dedication page and the publication page. And here's where our story begins. Back in John Deere's day, long before tractors and other newfangled contraptions, Americans dug the land with the same kind of plow that farmers had used as long as anyone could remember. That plow in the 1830s was surely less than perfect, but it worked. So who would want to change it? You guys know, don't you? Say it with me. John Deere, that's who. But John did not set out to build a new plow right away. He just was another young blacksmith from Vermont, a hard-working one, mind you. His fine skills earned him buckets of praise. Still, times were tough, and folks sometimes failed to pay him. John's business struggled. These are some nice paintings in this book. Then disaster struck. His forge burned to the ground. Of course, John rebuilt it. And then another fire. Soon he was out of cash and out of luck. John needed a fresh start. So with a few of his best iron working tools, he joined the stream of pioneers headed west in 1836. He planned to send for his wife and children when he was settled. How would you like to travel across many states in that, boys and girls? No air conditioning or heat. Luck started to shine on him when he arrived in Grand Tetour, Illinois. The little town needed a blacksmith to fix broken pots and pans horseshoes and pitchforks, and shovels and plows. Lots and lots of plows. John quickly built a forge. Smoke poured from the slow fire that burned from sunrise to sunset, and sometimes longer than that. Clang, clang, clang. He's got to heat it up and then pound it with his hammer into the shapes that he needs. That man was a workhorse, hammering red hot iron to repair tools so they were good as new, even better than new. John also fixed the farmer's heavy iron plows again and again. Stubborn twisted roots deep under the prairie banged up the iron blades. Even worse, the thick, rich soil the farmers called gumbo, in a not-so-nice way, stuck to their plows like gummy black snowballs. Farmers had to stop every so often to scrape the gumbo off with a paddle, and that made the day's work take a lot longer. John heard the farmers complain again and again. I reckon I clean that plow every near every few steps. It's going to take me forever and a day to plow my claim. Oofta, this heavy plow wrenches the dickens out of my back. They were tuckered out. Some farmers talked about hightailing it back east, where the soil was sandy and easy to till. John did not want to lose his customers. Truth be told, he missed his family, and he had a debt to pay. That's when John set his mind to building a better plow. He 
he needed to to save his business, didn't he? He tried new plow angles. He studied how the gumbel clung to the tiny pits in the iron. It's a fair guess that John already knew of other plow designs that called for lightweight steel rather than heavy iron. But steel was rare, and that far west, it was too pricey. He's thinking about it. How can he make it better? He'd like to use steel, but that's hard. Hard to get. Then one day at the sawmill in 1837, John found a broken steel saw blade that he could take back to his smithy. There, John chiseled off the saw's teeth and cut the steel into the shape of a plow's blade. He curved the long, curved it over a log so it would shrug off soil. And then he polished that steel as shiny as mother's sewing needles. Those needles could slip through calico like a hot knife through butter. Maybe a shiny plow would slice through that gumball. And there's his shiny plow design. Well, that was good thinking, Mr. John Deere. The town's families gathered at a local farmer's field to watch John test his gleaming self polisher. They did not expect much, but who amazed them all? You know it. John Deere, that's who. Stories of the day claimed he dug 12 rows neat as you please. Many farmers were still leery. That means they didn't know what to think of this new plow. John built several plows for farmers to just try out in their fields. Test after test, John's smooth steel plow cut so quickly and easily, it truly hummed down the rows. In time, customers began asking for Mr. Deer's singing plow. That's kind of funny, isn't it? You can bet John was happy to send for his family in 1838 and mighty relieved to settle his debt five years later. In another five years, the entire Deer family moved to Malloyne, Illinois. John wanted his company closer to the Mississippi River for better water power and easier deliveries. It says John Deere Plow Works on the building. All the while, John kept tinkering with the plow design to keep his customers happy. Under his leadership, John's company sold tens of thousands of singing plows and other horse-drawn equipment. Farmers plowed the prairie soil faster than ever. They planted more than enough crops for their families, selling the extra crops, and farming grew into a business. And the prairie's fields of grain became known as America's breadbasket. Maybe you've heard that expression. Right here in the Midwest where we live. So who changed the plow for America's farmers? Who changed the nation forever? John Deere, that's who. There he is. Now it's quite interesting in the back. There's a few other facts. Uh, there's a glossary in the back, and that's kind of like a dictionary where you can look up some words you might not have known in the story. But over here on this page, it says, dig into more facts about John Deere and his company. Well, down here, it says, John Deere did not invent the tractor, which many people think he did. He died 32 years before his company bought the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company and began selling the, Wa the Waterloo Boy Model R tractor, the granddaddy of all John Deere tractors. Deere and Company has sold carriages, wagons, and even bicycles in addition to plows and other farm equipment. Today, it's one of America's oldest manufacturing companies. And who started it all? John Deere, that's who. I wonder if you're going to vote for this book. Which one is going to be your favorite? You know, you get to be the judge pretty soon. I'll be sending you an email about that. Thanks so much for tuning in to listen to this story today. Bye. See you next time.